Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, today I am going to discuss the finer facets of functional proteomics and how it can be deciphered using an advanced protein microarray platforms. First we are going to talk to you about methods to study protein protein interactions and then I am going to provide you an overview of protein microarray platforms, how it can be used to study various interactions and other applications. Conventionally, there have been different methods which have been used to study protein protein interactions. For example, traditional approaches including yeast to hybrids, affinity chromatography, immunoprecipitation methods were used. More recently, there are high throughput methods like protein microarrays, surface plasmon resonance, and other label free technologies which have been used for the studying biomolecular interactions. So, let me kind of you know give you a very brief overview of the conventional methods which have been used uh, over long time for studying biomolecular interactions uh, especially protein protein interactions using immunoprecipitation method. In immunoprecipitation method the purification of protein complex is achieved by immunoprecipitation or tandem affinity purification or TAP method. The target protein and its interacting partners they are isolated from the complex uh, tissue lysates or complex samples. Then they are separated on the denaturing gel LGS page and now you can see those are the as shown on the image uh, different bands can be seen which are potential interactors. However, it is not very clear that you know these are the direct interactors or they could be sticky proteins which are also interacting with your proteins of interest. So, therefore, you will have the potential list, but you are not very sure these are the, the real interactors or these are the even uh, potential sticky proteins. Another method which has been used in the past is yeast to hybrid method. In yeast to hybrid the base uh, binding domain and the prey activation domain hybrid proteins are jointly expressed in the yeast nucleus and if the protein protein interaction is established then it results into the activation of reporter gene and you can see the transcription initiation to happen. So, that is something conventionally used a uh, lot of people have used uh, this kind of you know yeast to hybrid method. Uh, however, it results into uh, you know large number of false positive as well because you will get you know a big list of interactors, but you are not entirely sure how many of them are actually direct interacted. So, these methods were uh, used traditionally they are quite easy to achieve nevertheless you know they do give you the larger list from which you are very unsure that you know which are the right interactors for the given protein or which could be the potential uh, protein, but there could be sticky proteins and they may not be the right proteins and could be false positives as well. So, uh, with the advent of new technologies uh, in the area of protein microarrays, uh, there are different type of microarray platforms have been established to look into protein protein interactions as well as many other clinical applications. All right. So, let me give you an overview of uh, protein microarray platforms. So, what are protein microarrays? These are microscopic arrays which comprised of thousands of discrete proteins printed on the array surface. These high throughput platforms could be used for many applications such as biomarker discovery, protein protein interactions and various type of functional characterization. Uh, you can use different type of contents and accordingly your array platform could be termed as antibody arrays or protein arrays. For example, if antibodies are immobilized on the array surface that is an antibody array which can be used to measure the abundance of biomolecule. For example, if you are looking at a level of a given protein for which you have antibody, now if you are passing your biomolecule uh, on the chip then you can measure the level or the concentration or the abundance of that particular uh, protein uh, using this antibody based approach. Additionally, there have been target protein arrays where different forms of the functionalized proteins are printed on the array surface and those are known as the target protein arrays. Historically long back uh, in 2000 uh, Gavin Macbeth first time showed that you know uh, it is possible to 
print the proteins on the chip. They printed only two proteins, one protein was printed in the large number of times, one protein printed once only and wanted to show the specificity of detecting even one protein on the chip among thousands of features printed uh, using E. coli uh, purified protein. And that first time established that you know the protein microarrays in principle are achievable. Let us now review some of these concepts in an animation. Protein microarrays are widely used for protein interaction studies. One of the proteins to be analyzed is printed onto a microarray surface, usually made of glass. The proteins known as bait proteins get immobilized onto the array surface that is functionalized with reagents like nickel or aldehyde compounds that interact with the groups present in the protein. This bait protein is then probed for interactions with suitably labeled query or prey proteins. Any unbound proteins are washed off the array surface. Once the unbound proteins are washed off the array surface, the protein interactions are detected by means of an array scanner. These protein microarrays are extremely useful in studying interactions with other proteins as well as small molecules, DNA or RNA. Let us now talk about a different type of a protein microarrays platform for example, the direct labeling based method. In direct labeling, the target proteins are labeled with fluorescence or some other type of tag molecules which allows detection after it is captured on the antibody which is immobilized on the array surface as shown in the uh, slide on the, in the image. Additional uh, you can also use the sandwich amino assay where the target protein is captured by an antibody and it followed by the detection with uh, labeled secondary antibodies. So, that is the sandwich amino assay. Uh, another approach which is clinically quite relevant is a reverse phase protein blots in which the complex mixtures such as cell lysates are printed and probed with the specific detection labels. So, many times clinicians have these complex tissue lysate or cell lysate and they want to just detect one of the specific uh, antibody and specific proteins out of those samples and then reverse phase arrays could be very quickly employed for that purpose. Uh, protein microarrays uh, ideally can be done with the purified proteins, uh, although the obtaining large number of purified proteins is a challenge. And therefore, uh, making protein arrays from the purified proteins has not been you know so rapid not been uh, used by many labs and many uh, companies are not around to print the entire protein arrays. But still if ideally you have access to the protein contents then using the chemical uh, linkage of immobilizing the purified protein on the functional slide uh, can be very powerful. Additionally, if you have identified some peptide sequences let us say you know we have done the mass spectrometry experiments on the previous lectures and now you have identified some peptides of you know your interest which you want to now further confirm and validate. So, then those could be uh, synthesized artificially one could make those peptide fusions and then print those on the array surface and then now screen those in the array format. Uh, in addition to looking at the uh, contents directly from the protein scientists have also thought about can we use in vitro transcription and translation based methods where proteins could be synthesized on the chip directly without having need to purify them. So, the whatever machinery in the body makes the protein which involves the process for transcription and translation can we provide those material on the chip itself and from those contents now the proteins can be synthesized on the chip. So, people have taken let us say uh, the uh, cDNA containing the gene of interest from which you want to make protein and now you, uh, a, a approach which is known as NAPA nucleic acid programmable protein array has been used where a captured antibody uh, is immobilized along with your uh, DNA or the gene of interest. Now, let us say if your uh, uh, gene of interest contains a tag GST, so the captured antibody will be anti GST captured antibody and then to immobilize them you have to use some other molecules like you have to use the cross linker like BS3 
uh, to uh, help the strong binding you can use the BSA. So, those are part of the chemistry of how to make the NAPA arrays, but conceptually you can start from the gene and make the protein directly on the chip by using the cell free in vitro transcription and translation method. That is one of the very powerful method and couple of uh, technologies have also come forward which have used a similar type of concept like a multiple spotting technique or BIST technology, where they have used uh, PCR products, uh, unpurified PCR products, added cell free lysates and then try to make the chip uh, which is protein arrays eventually. Uh, another promising approach uh, in the field of making the uh, protein microarrays has been DNA arrays to protein arrays or DAPA, uh, where you start with the DNA printed on the glass slide and uh, imagine that your, your DNA has the uh, you know the histidine tag. Uh, now, once you add the in vitro transcription translation uh, to make the protein on the chip, uh, then these proteins which are uh, you know you can add in uh, one permeable membrane the proteins which are synthesized they will pass through permeable membrane and on another glass slide you have added uh, you know let us say nickel NTA on the uh, glass slide. So, all the proteins which are uh, you know coming out of this particular DNA slide which are having the histidine tag could be now immobilized on to second slide which is having the uh, your nickel NTA coated on the slide. So, as shown in the, the image that you know now you can have the pure, pure proteins coming out from the membrane and they could be immobilized uh, on the new chip and from the same glass slide actually you can uh, from the same DNA slide you can actually make couple of slides of for the protein array. So, you can increase your efficiency of generating these you know uh, the protein arrays uh, from the same DNA template slide. Uh, a more commercial approach has come forward uh, recently which, which is halotag arrays, uh, where on the glass slide these halotag ligands uh, the chloroalkanes uh, are printed and then your DNA of uh, gene of interest contains uh, this particular tag which is halotags and now uh, when the proteins are synthesized after doing cell free expression based approach, then these halotags are going to bind to the ligands on the uh, chip and you can have the very strong covalent interaction. So, these kind of you know cell free expression approaches are very uh, uh, relevant because uh, when you are doing the uh, lot of microarray based studies you have to do many you know washing steps and you have to do many processing steps. Those could be easily avoided if you can use these halotag arrays, although you know the uh, limitations are that you know you have to clone these, you have to add the halotag uh, uh, in the uh, gene of interest, you have to use these kind of chip platforms which will having the uh, ligands coated on the slide. So, uh, briefly I have shown you kind of you know the glimpse of an overview of protein microarray platform so far, uh, which could be broadly uh, you know classified into abundance based as well as the function based microarrays. In the abundance based microarray, we talked about the antibodies which could be linked with the different type of antibody based platform like direct labeling, sandwich amino assays and reverse phase protein arrays. In the function based arrays, we talked about purified protein or the peptide arrays or looking into the NAPA arrays or the MIST approach. All of these things are uh, various possibility for doing uh, protein microarray based platforms. I must would like to remind you you know based on our previous lecture discussion that uh, the DNA microarray has been very powerful and which has been used from long time probably from 1990s you know it was very actively used and uh, the DNA microarrays conceptually involves uh, let us say we have the cancer cell and the normal cell from which the RNA has been extracted. Uh, then you are converting RNA to the cDNA forms which you have learnt in the molecular biology modules. And now, uh, each of the cDNA from the control and the cancer cell could be labeled with uh, psi 3 and psi 5 uh, tags as you can see the schematic here. Uh, they are combined equally now and then they are allowed to hybridize on the chip surface and wherever they you know hybridize looking at the uh, you know ability of the complementary sequences to bind to the mobilized DNA probes. Now, you can detect those signals on the DNA microarray, which is conceptually different than the protein microarray, but I am just trying to give you the parallelism that how DNA microarrays have been used for different applications uh, shown in the slide here again to remind you that you know different dots different colors can be seen uh, which are red in the color, green in the color, yellow in the color or the gray uh, color. So, uh, looking at that if you have labeled with psi 3 or psi 5 one condition like control or your uh, cancer cells then accordingly now you can uh, uh, decide that you know what is the over expression or the down regulation of the given uh, genes in a given system. And a similar kind of concepts have been very powerful clinically in fact, 
uh, where uh, clinicians and the you know molecular biology scientists worked together and looked into the breast cancer one of the, the major problem where all the women suffering from breast tumor do not you know uh, respond to the same kind of drugs. So, when people had looked into their gene expression signature using uh, these kind of protein microarrays and other expression analysis, then they found out that you know all the women who are having the breast cancer they could be broadly under four subtypes. Uh, so, they are not on one disease alone there are four major subtypes could be you know laminate subtype A, it could be laminate subtype B, it could be uh, ERBB2, it can be basal subtype and of course, you are comparing with the normal uh, breast like uh, appearance. So, based on these you know whether it belongs to the luminal A, luminal B, HER2 or the basal like then uh, the treatment modalities could be defined. This just shows you illustrates you the practical usage of the technologies how it can be so helpful for the clinicians to make the decision that what kind of drugs to be given. Uh, coming back to the protein microarrays. So, uh, protein microarrays have been used for many applications especially uh, looking at identifying the protein biomarkers, doing the protein protein interaction studies, protein modifications like phosphorylation, glycosylation, acetylation etcetera. All of these have been studied using protein microarrays. One of the other you know the strong application of this is uh, uh, looking for autoantibodies. Many times for you know different autoimmune disorders and cancer uh, you know uh, body will start producing some antibodies to try to combat and fight the disease and those could be detected on the uh, protein arrays and uh, you know one such array platform you know we have used for our own research in the brain tumor uh, where we have used the uh, human proteome arrays which contains all the you know human proteins possible uh, till date which is 19,000 proteins. And after you know uh, we took the serum samples from uh, different uh, patients suffering from the uh, grade 2, grade 3 and grade 4 of the brain tumors gliomas. And then uh, you know uh, along with the healthy individuals uh, comparison with the control uh, after looking at a signal then we could identify you know some unique biomarkers uh, which are appearing in the grade 2 patients or grade 3 patients or grade 4 patient. And as shown here couple of images which shows that you know the some of the biomarkers are showing the sequential increase of the uh, you know over expression of the proteins and probably those could be used for the early indicator of the disease. Uh, and some so like SNX1 uh, as shown you know showing you increased continuous. So, with the IGHG1 which also shows you from the you know control to the higher grade continuous increase. Uh, some proteins like IA1 and PQBP1 show the reverse response like it is higher in the control and it goes down regulated as you know over the period uh, in the higher grades. Uh, this kind of you know the analysis also gives us the much better understanding of what is happening physiologically in these patients. For example, uh, when the disease progresses from the low grade to the higher grade from the grade 2, 3 and 4, then what kind of you know the genes and what, the, what kind of proteins are being expressed, uh, are there some new unique proteins appearing as the disease progresses from the low to the high grade and what kind of major pathways are you know being uh, changed. So, those kind of studies even basic molecular biologists can do and obtain by using these kind of high throughput screening. We have also used similar kind of platform for looking at the infectious disease responses and in this case you know it is shown for the malaria proteins when we have both falciparum and YVAX uh, uh, antigens printed on the chip and we are looking at the humoral immune response to the patient suffering from falciparum or YVAX malaria. I just want to illustrate to you that these kind of platforms can be used for many pro many projects, many different diseases, many biological questions can be addressed. We have also looked at uh, the colorectal cancer and identify certain kind of you know network and hubs looking at the network analysis obtained from the uh, our you know, mass spec data and some of the uh, microarray data. So, in conclusion we have today discussed uh, you know broadly the interactomics field. Uh, some of the traditional approaches being used especially immunoprecipitation looking at the yeast 2 hybrid uh, and then kind of I uh, moved uh, to describe you about different type of protein microarray platforms which are which are used for different applications and these protein microarray platform could be from the you know antibodies to the purified proteins to the DNA content itself by using the self free expression based microarrays which could be used for many applications uh, whether it is cancer or infectious disease or to understand different type of you know basic biological questions. So, uh, now I am going to stop here and we will take you now for the lab demonstration session where we are going to show you uh, how to do this kind of microarray experiment uh, especially the protein microarray based experiment directly inside the laboratory. Thank you. So, I will be showing how to do autoantibody screening using Huprot arrays. So, after adding blocking solution you have to keep it for 2 hour incubation in room temperature with gentle shaking. So, we are keeping in the rocker. 
So after 2 hour incubation we have to wash the solution. So for that we are using 1x TBST of pH 7.4. So first you have to discard the blocking solution. Then you add uh, 1x TBST. Then you keep it rocker. This step has to be repeated for 4 times for 5 minutes. So after the last wash you have to discard the washing solution completely. Then uh, you have to incubate with primary antibody which is a mixture of 1 in 500 dilution of serum and 1 in 5000 dilution of uh, anti GST. So now you are adding the 10 ml volume of 1x TBST containing 1 in 500 dilution of your serum and uh, anti GST antibody. Then you keep it for 2 hour incubation. So after incubating with primary antibody we again uh, repeated the washing step. Now the next step is incubation with secondary antibody. So now we are discarding the washing solution. And this step is very cautious because it, the secondary antibodies are labeled with the fluorescent dye. So you have to do it in the dark and uh, or cover it with the foil. So this is secondary antibody. It is a mixture of uh, 1 in 1000 dilution of anti-human IgG which is labeled with sci-fi and 1 in 5000 dilution of uh, anti-rabbit antibody which is sci 3 labeled. So once you added the solution that is the antibody solution you have to cover the box with uh, a foil or any other dark or you can use a dark box also. So now we will keep it for 2 hour incubation. So I am keeping the secondary antibody for 2 hour incubation. After secondary antibody incubation we again wash the slides the same way then after washing we will dry the slides using centrifuge and make sure that all the steps are um, all the steps has to be performed in dark because the slide is already incubated with uh, Sci3 and Sci5 fluorescent label dyes. So, you just have to open the centrifuge. Take the slide, keep it in the cassette which is uh, designed for the microarray experiment. So, once you keep the slide, close the lid. And here the parameters are speed is 900 rpm, time is 2 minutes, acceleration and deceleration is 8 and 8 and the temperature is room temperature. So once you keep the slides then uh, spin it. So just you have to start the spinning. So after centrifugation now we are going to take out the slides. So you can see the, now the slide is completely dry. So after complete drying now we have to scan the slides in two different wavelengths. One is 635 which is for the red channel and the 532 for green channel. So the 635 will the red channel will show the anti-human IgG that is the autoantibodies in patient sera and uh, Sci3 that is the green channel which, which is a QC check uh, it will show all the printed protein spot. So uh, once you have the dry slide what you have to do is you have to uh, take this slide and put it for scanning. This is the scanner uh, it is GenePix 4000B it is it scans at two wavelengths. So uh, slides are always kept facing downwards that is the proteins that are printed should always face downwards. 
so this is how we keep the slide inside the cassette make sure the slide is aligned properly and is fixed properly otherwise it might get broken inside the scanner so uh, once we you keep the slides properly you have to close the door and then just close it so make sure that the scanner is kept on for 20 minutes to stabilize all the laser lasers so uh, once we keep the slide inside the scanner we open genepix pro software it will search for the scanner it will calibrate it and then the slides are ready for scanning so what you do is you set the uh, wavelength because it's a dual channel thing you set it for for red channel we set it at 635 nanometers for green channel we set the wavelength at 532 nanometers and then we go for the pmt settings so usually we keep pmt settings at red channel at 500 pmt gain 100% power laser power and pmt gain at 3 for 50 this uh, settings you can optimize using opt auto pmt i'll show you how this pmt settings work so let's start the uh, preview scan for the same this exper uh, the scanning is more or less like you scan your documents in a scanner so here what you do is you scan the area for the slide and then you can just look here if you zoom it into zoom into it you can see how the panel looks like now when you uh, change the pmt setting say i put it at 700 you can see that the power for this channel is increasing and you are getting more uh, more of the brighter spots and more of the saturated spots now if i reduce if i increase this also to say 600 then you can see that the whole intensity is increasing so uh, pmt's parameters are very important because when you have to scan a slide all the slide all the spots should be scanned at a particular wavelength and you don't want to miss out on a lot of uh, spots as well as you don't want most of the spots to be saturated so auto pmt is one of the options where you can go and it will just scan the slide at three different wavelengths and it will try to fix at 5% saturated spots and uh, you can get a pmt at which you should scan the slide at both the channels so this is how the preview scan looks like so once you have done it you can just lay over the grid like the way you put you set a area for your paper scanning you can set the area for scanning of the slide so if you want only the, this much of area to be scanned you can just resize the you can just uh, resize the frame and then you can start the scanning of the slides so this you can see that the scanning uh, is a very is a comparatively slow process and uh, if you zoom into it you can see that the spots are like quite proper now so this is how the scanning is performed once you have the scan slide you can just uh, stop and save this file the scanned image i'll just show you how to further process the image so once you have this you just go to genepix pro analysis software you open that you go to uh, to the saved images you can open images and select your image that you want to see i'll just zoom into one of the blocks here this is how in green channel the slide looks like and green channel is majorly done for the uh, for checking the quality of the slide for checking the printing quality of the slide so now if you look here it is uh, these spots have no identity here but when you put a gal file over it gal file is the file which is uh, given with uh, each and every each and every slide vendor gives you a gal file which tells you the location of these slide these proteins on a slide so you can just adjust all the blocks together and you can try to just fix it onto the slide i'll further zoom it here 
Now, if you look, each and every spot will have a name, a ID, because this is the identity identity of the protein. So now you can just try to rephrase it, try to align it properly. So now you see that this slide is properly aligned, but some of the features because uh, so here are the settings which are given to the slide. Here, uh, yeah, here in the setting you can define the minimum diameter which it should consider for a spot and the maximum diameter which it should consider so that it do not pick any spec as a back uh, any background as a spot. So, and we also tell what is what should be your comparative background intensity ab above which only a threshold above, above which only it should consider a spot. So, if you zoom in here some spots say this a spot is not considered as a spot because of the background intensity is way more as compared to uh, as compared to the actual spot. So, but here you see these are these are the spots in duplicate and here you can see that this spot can be is a spot and it is not an artifact. So, you will just have to uh, you just have to press F and try to resize it and take it as a spot. Again here if you see that these two spots are the diagonal duplicate spots. So, this is also a spot, but because of this background it has taken it has not take considered considered it as a spot. So, now you will again resize the spot and take the exact intensity and the circle uh, the encircled area is the intensity which it tries to uh, average out and give you a spot intensity. So, that is why it should be a really compact spot consisting only of uh, consisting only of your protein of interest. So, once that is done once you lay the grid for all the all the blocks all the blocks in the slide you will just go to data and then it will analyze the file analyze the intensity at green channel as well as at red channel and you it will give you a dot gpr file which is called as dot genepix pro the genepix result files and this is how the all the parameters are given like the diameter of the at what location it is present the diameter of the spot what is the foreground value what is the background value and then you can just export the result you can select it all by control a and then you can save the results as dot gpr file so once you save the file as dot gpr file the files can be opened in excel and it gives you all the information of the pmt gain the scan power and the date with on which it has been scanned and what all uh, gal file features have been used for scanning it also gives you a value of foreground and background and this is how the for all the protein uh, it gives you the id name and all the diameter and the intensity at which it has acquired and then you can of all the intensity which it has acquired and then you can just uh, select these files you can use foreground minus background value foreground median minus background median value for the statistical analysis so you take all the details from each and every slide and then you do a statistical analysis for uh, getting the autoantibodies if there are any in some of the patients and to look at the differential expression of autoantibodies amongst different groups of patients. <laughs>